there. Welcome back to our Bayes Rules Book Club. And we're going to take on Chapter 14, Naive Bayes Classification today. Another great technique is available in Bayesian analysis. We're going to explore the pros and cons of our new method. And what we're doing is generalizing the classification task for more than two categories. In the previous chapter about logistic regression, we were dealing with the classification task, but for binary variables. And now we're asking ourselves what to do in situations where we have more than two categories. We'll be using some of these packages here. The data set for this chapter is the ubiquitous Palmer Penguins data set, beloved by data scientists and data science instructors um, in many places. Cur the data set is currently curated by Dr. Allison Horst and her colleagues. So there are multiple penguin species throughout Antarctica, and we're going to focus on the Ad Ad Aditi Finstrap and Gentoo penguins um, hereafter with our response variable y. Let capital A correspond to Aditi, C correspond to Chinstrap, and G correspond to Gentoo penguins. And as a personal challenge throughout today's chapter notes, um, based on this artwork here, I'm going to try to color code the penguin species. So purple for Chinstrap green for Gentoo, and orange for Aditi. We could have categorical variables. Let's for a moment say that X1 means that we are above the average weight of 4,200 grams for the penguin and a zero for below average weight. For build length and build depth, sometimes in the literature called Coleman length and Coleman depth, we have numerical variables x2 and x3. A version of this penguin's data set is available in the Bayes rules package. And looking at this table here after called penguins, we see that we have decent sample sizes for the three penguin species. Approximately 44 of them were Adelie penguins, approximately 20% were chin strap and approximately 36% are Gentoo. All right, so we're thinking about naive Bayes classification because we have three categories, whereas logistic regression is limited to classifying binary response variables. We're thinking of this naive Bayes classification as an alternative to logistic regression. Because of that reason, we could classify the categorical response variables with two or more categories. We will see mathematically, it doesn't require much theory beyond Bayes rule. And it's computationally efficient because we do not need to rely on um, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation in the background. All those reasons sound great, but we as students have to then stop and ask ourselves, hey, wait a second, why did people call this naive? Why is it called a naive Bayes classification? And we will see that as well in this chapter.
we start off with a model with one categorical predictor. Suppose an Antarctic researcher comes across a penguin that weighs less than 4,200 grams with a 195 millimeter long flipper and a 50 millimeter long bill. Our goal is to help this researcher identify the species of the penguin ideally transcribed into. For the categorical predictor zero and one, here we have a bar graph, the species on the horizontal, the proportions on the vertical. And we're briefly asking ourselves, for which species is that below average weight most likely? Here in my picture, below average penguins are labeled in purple, and the above average penguins are labeled in orange. So if we um, follow the wording below average, we see that the likelihood is highest for the chin strap penguins, the bar in the middle. What we call Bayes rule a bit here. Remember Bayes rule? Um, as we studied way back in, I believe, chapter two, we're taking the prior probabilities, multiply by the likelihoods, divide by the normalizing constant, and on the left, we achieve our posterior distribution. For the denominator, we have by the law of total probability, oops, a bit of a typo there, because we have the three species a DOA chin strap in Gentoo represented by capital A, C, and G here, we now have three terms in that denominator for the total probability. To help us with the calculations there at the bottom half of the screen, we could uh, create a table, a, a tally. The zeros represented the below average weight, one represents above average weight, and the number of penguins that fell within each of those categories, along with the marginal totals. So our prior probabilities, oh, out of the 342 penguins, 151 were DOA, 68 were chin strap, 123 were Gentoo. These likelihoods, the likelihood that a below x1 equals zero um, throughout this example, x1 equals zero means we're talking about the below average weight um, penguin. And the likelihood is a, a DOA chin strap Gentoo are given by those numbers there. 83, uh, 90, and 5%. These likelihoods were in this picture here. So once again, at the moment, the likelihood is highest for the chin strap species in the middle. The Total probability, which will be the denominator in our Bayes rule, is formed by those three terms to so once again talk about the three species. And finally, using Bayes rule for each species, the probability of a DOE given that is a below average weight penguin is about 65%. Similarly, for chin strap, it's 32%, and Gentoo is 3%. So what happened was um, using Bayes' rule to acknowledge both the prior probability and the likelihoods, we actually find that with the below average weight penguin, the posterior probability for a a DOE is more than twice as much as the other two species.
let's try to model as one numerical predictor. So ignoring the weight for now. Let's classify a species using only the fact that it has a 15 millimeter long bill. On the graph, the 15 millimeters is highlighted by the vertical dashed line. We have the density plots for the three species. And we're asking ourselves that question, for which species is the 15 millimeter long bill the most common? We have a slight lead for the purple region. So it looks like we're aiming for the chin strap penguins. That is the probability of a 50 millimeter long bill for a DOE in orange is virtually zero. Um, a decent probability for the Gentoo penguins in green, but a slightly higher probability still for the chin strap penguins in purple. In case anybody's curious, I put the code for the images in the notes. So our data points to a penguin being a chin strap, but we've already seen a bit in a previous example that we must weigh this data against the fact that the chin strap penguins are the rarest of the species in the data set and probably um, in the population as well. Also, we got to ask ourselves, what does it mean to compute the likelihood in these continuous situations? Because it's not just going to be a, a table of values, a, a, a tally or a count. So this is one area where the naive part comes in when we talk about Bayes classification. The na naive Bayes method typically assumes that the, any quantitative predictor, in this case x2, is continuous and it's also conditionally normal. So we say that the probability of X2, uh, given that the species is ideally has a normal distribution with some sort of mean and variance. Similarly, for Shinstrap and Gentoo, we're also assuming normal distributions, perhaps with different means and different variances. So for our probability distributions, long story short, from a statistics class, uh, it's, you're okay with going with the sample mean and sample standard deviations from the data. So we'll grab those. We have in this table here, the mean and standard deviations for the three species. And this is for the numerical variable bill length. And what we'll do is plot these using the stat function layer, denorm function with the parameters of, as you can see, matching up with the table at the top of the page. So in other words, we have this as the observed data from the data set. And in our naive Bayes point of view, we are now looking at these prior probabilities having assumed normal distributions. The overall task, once again, is asking ourselves which species is the most likely with a penguin that has a 50 millimeter bill length. Once again, um, in orange, the probability of a DOE is virtually zero. In green, we have some probability for Gentoo penguins, but arguably the highest probability in purple for the chin strap penguins.
one thing that surprised me as a statistics teacher is that we're going to use the R code to compute the likelihoods this way with uh, the vertical, where the vertical line is basically on the graph. We'll once again use the, uh, we, we will be using the denorm function in this example. And we could get the likelihoods in 43 species. Once again, virtually zero for a DOE, um, something for Gentoo, but the highest for Chinstra. And this is still observing the 50 millimeter build length of, of one penguin. So for total probability, having the three terms in the denominator and then Bayes rule to acknowledge the prior probabilities and the likelihoods put together. We see that with a 50 millimeter build length, of virtually no probability for a DOE, about a 40% posterior uh, probability for chin strap, but a 60% posterior probability for Gentoo. And part of this was because of the relative sizes of the population in the data set. So though a 50 millimeter long bill is relatively less common among Gentoo than chin straps, because of how we ran naive Bayes classification and the prior probabilities, et cetera, we find that Gentoo has the highest posterior probability. So, so far, we made two naive Bayes classifications, one based only on below average weight and the other based only on the 50 millimeter long bill. So categorical, numerical. One, the first, the answer in the first example was a DOE. In the second example is Gentoo. So these classifications disagree so far. So we quickly think to ourselves, well, why don't we just um, put, put these together? There's room for improvement here. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Yes. Okay. okay. Can you just uh, scroll a bit up um, to uh, where we define X1 and X2? So that's X1. Okay. And at the bottom of the screen are X2 and X3. Okay, so X2 is the bill length. Um, and then how do we, how, how we calculate the, the likelihood? In the most recent example, the likelihood through R code. Yeah. So with the D norm, so uh, that and that that is the the result of the this uh, D norm. Is that um, so? For example, the likelihood of um, the first species. Yes, less two point. Uh, um, is the is this the result of the norm fifty mean? Um, if I not because I'm, um, I'm not sure about that. If I so do in, uh, on the picture, we are inputting our observation of the fifty millimeter build length, which is the black vertical line. The likelihood is 
asking uh, where do we intersect with the orange normal distribution uh -huh. that had a smaller mean and this standard deviation. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. So I do ca I calculate this uh, to have the probability, the expected uh, value. Yes, the likelihood values, right. Uh, for, for each uh, species, and I use D norm with the 50 as a, uh, like central value or the, the value that I want to make. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the uh, uh, probability that I will be around this value or something, yeah, based on the mean and the standard deviation for each of the species. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, usually in probabilities, when we talk about continuous variables, we usually do this calculation over an interval of values rather than just plug in one number. So that aspect surprised me too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we'll move on to two predictive variables. Um, they're in black in the subtitle. Once again, the hypothetical uh, was looking at a Penguin with a 50 millimeter long bill and a 100 millimeter long flipper. So that's labeled with the black dashed lines in the picture. Looking at the this situation, a numerical variable on the x-axis, a numerical variable on the y-axis, a horizontal vertical. We have our scatter plot. And then we are asking ourselves, uh, what's that? Hypothetical penguin of 50 millimeter long bill, 195 millimeter long flipper. Um, these here if I just annotate. Looking there at that intersection, we're asking ourselves uh, which species is it most likely to be? So now dealing with X2 and X3, we need to um, update our underlying mathematics, the Bayes rule of it all. And this is another naive assumption of our calculations. We're gonna assume that in the conditional probabilities that we do have independence. This is a pretty uneasy or tenuous, but this is how the calculations do go for this particular procedure. So the likelihood of a species based on X2 and X3 data, we're going to assume independence, meaning that we could deal with their prior probability separately. It's mathematically efficient, but for one thing, this is ignoring the obvious correlations in the picture, in the data. So somewhat similar to the previous example, for the prior probabilities, we could use the sample means and standard deviations, and we could grab a table of values. We've already computed the likelihoods before when x2 is 50. Now, based on the conditional independence 
assumption, part of the naivete. We could also look at X3 when X3 is 195 millimeters. That is the bill, that is the footprint length. Looking at that 195, and based on the sample statistics for the three species of penguins. Our total probability has those three terms. Ooh, just stretches across the page there. Bayes rule balances the prior probability and the likelihoods. Now looking at penguins with those two pieces of information, the 50 millimeter um, build length for X2, the 195 millimeter footprint length for X3. On the bottom right here, we have the posterior distributions for the three species. And we find that the number is definitely the highest. So we say that a penguin is almost certainly a chin strap penguin. Which is also what we found in this picture here, that the location was in the purple region. So we were led to thinking that this is a chin strap penguin. Okay, so now that we talked about the mathematics for a bit, um, audience would, would be curious about how to implement this in their computer programming, especially if you had more than, say, three categories, uh, you probably would not want to carry out these calculations by hand anymore. There is a naive base function in the E1071 package. What's called model one using naive Bayes, what's called that naive model one, that's a species explained by just build length, just one predictor variable. And for model two, we'll run the naive Bayes on a model of species explained by two predictor variables, build length and footprint length. As before, our observed penguin has a build length of 50 millimeters and a footprint length of 195. When we do predictions, plugging in the model one with our observed penguin, if you leave this type equals raw parameter, you get the you get the posterior distributions, just like in the examples um, we saw earlier. If you do not explicitly have that parameter set, it will actually just go ahead and tell you the category label for the answer. For model two, which had the two predictive variables, so hopefully it's a better model, we once again see that the probability for chin strap was nearly 99%. That is these three numbers here matched um, what we got from the doing the calculations and double checking them through Bayes rule. So we indeed land on a chin strap penguin. Now, uh, folks who have done machine learning realize that working only with the data might lead to generalization issues later, the bias variance trade-off for instance. So we should, um, validate what's going on. We could look at the confusion matrices, that is, uh, have the real world observed data, um, line it up side by side, or let me say this again, uh, with some code to make a confusion matrix. 
and putting together the predictions next to the penguins data frame. This species column here is the uh, real world observed data. Class one was the one predictor variable. Here are the predicted species labels. And class two was the two predictor variables. Here are the species labels. So in other words, for the first species, or so, sorry, for the first penguin, which is chin strap, the first model misclassified, made a mistake here, but the second model got it right. For the second penguin, which is Gentoo, the first model misclassified, made a mistake, but the second model got it right. And for the third and fourth penguins, both models correctly classified the penguin as a DOE. So let's dive deeper. In naive model one that had one predictor variable, we end up with this confusion matrix here. Correct predictions will be on the main diagonal. So that's where you want your biggest numbers and percentages. Overall, this model has an accuracy of 76%. But where it's particularly problematic is that for the chin strap penguins, it actually classified 85% of them as Gentoo. That's, that's a pretty large misclassification rate for that one species. So then for model two, with the two predictor variables of build length and footprint length, we once again, in the confusion matrix, are seeking out the highest proportions on the main diagonal. And this time, we get an accuracy of 95%, much higher than the 76% we see in the previous model. to um, mitigate or lessen our worry about the bias variance trade-off, we could perform cross-validation. The Bayes rule textbook package includes this naive classification, cross-validation function, basically taking all the mathematics and processes that we study this chapter. It could be done with this function here, I'll give it a model, uh, run it over the original data set, state the categorical response variable, and we're going to perform tenfold cross validation. You could do various things with the cross validated model, but for now, we'll simply look at the confusion matrix and verify that we do have the largest proportions on the main diagonal. And once again, we have a pretty good model for classifying the penguins based on those two predictive variables, build length and footprint length. So in summary, the naive Bayes process, we could consider more than two categories for the response variable. We are, of course, mathematically on running through Bayes rule. We also assumed, <clears throat> excuse me. In the underlying likelihoods, we've also assumed uh, conditional independence, which helped make things computationally efficient. I could verify that all the R codes that we ran here uh, took under one second each. Generalized into more than two categories. 
the issue is that some of these assumptions that we made along the way uh, tend to be violated by the actual real world data quite often. So that's something to worry about. This naive base, especially if, um, compared, we could compare it to the previous chapter's material on logistic regression. The logistic regression was a binary classifier, say if you're comparing ones and zeros or some other similar binaries um, or Bernoulli setting. However, logistic regression, as plain we've seen in the formula, you could get regression coefficients. So if you're doing this modeling professionally, you would probably want to highlight or illuminate the relationship between the variables. Whereas what naive Bayes does is it is it only gives you the the labels at the end and some of the posterior distributions. But if you needed to know things like um, how the variables are related to each other or coefficients such as um, them being positive or negative, and perhaps even rates of change, then logistic regression um, has much more information than naive base. Scheduling wise, I had told the audience that I was also going to talk about chapter 15 for a few minutes, but for now, we've reached the end of chapter 14. Um, are there any questions from the audience or more commentary? Uh, not for now, then. Great. Actually, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, actually, I have I had one. If mm -hmm. it, can you go to the summary, the cross validation summary? function yeah so th this function here that uh, basically uh, result on uh, release the same uh, releases the same result of the uh, table uh, above yes okay. it is right so um, we didn't perform any cross validation Is that right? So, uh, so you're correct. Um, the first table is did not have cross validation. The second right. one did, but they do pr produce similar results. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and so they, basically they did because they are exactly the same. Right, and it's probably. Uh, coincidence based on the relatively small uh, data set, relatively simple situation. Okay. But okay. that's a good observation. Okay, folks. So in the Bayes rule um, textbook, we are now moving on to chapter 15, which takes us into unit four. And I want to, before I forget, I uh, thank uh, previous cohorts for making uh, this set of notes for chapter 15. I'll blatantly um, go over them for a few minutes here. Uh, in unit four, uh, title of hierarchical models are exciting. We're going to expand our toolbox for hierarchical um, or grouped, sometimes called grouped or pooled data. Some examples of hierarchical models are where it could be useful is a group of schools where our response variable y is on multiple students within each school. Um, laboratory experiments are response variable y, multiple experiments within a lab. And in general, just um, multiple observations, perhaps over time. Well, introduce the concepts today, or at least some of the motivations. And then the way the remaining chapters go is hierarchical models without predictors, with normal distribution, with not normal distributions, and then finally how to add more, more layers, 
kind of motivating us towards deep learning. So for now, chapter 15, we're going to explore the limitations of our current Bayesian toolbox under two extremes, complete pooling and no pooling. Um, we'll explain what that is in just a second. Examine the benefits of partial pooling provided by hierarchical Bayesian models. And admittedly, we're just going to focus on the big ideas and definitions and leave the details for the future chapters and sessions. We're going to consider the cherry blossom sample data of, sorry, the cherry blossom uh, race is a chance for people to run recreationally. They have a 5K and a 10 mile race. This is, this was held in Washington DC every spring, um, or last before the pandemic. And what the data set has is data about 36 runners who happened to run the race often enough that it might be an interesting point of view. In fact, the in the data set, each runner, each sorry, each runner ran the race in seven consecutive years. So they were all the same in that regard. They all competed in seven consecutive years. Their time on the vertical axis. I think this was for the 10. Sorry, I forgot the units. Um, the times on the vertical axis, but moreover, you could see the box plots to give a sense that over the seven years, the runners um, sometimes uh, ran faster, sometimes ran a little slower, and but they varied individually. And also of note was um, the authors focused on these 36 runners because they were all in the same age group, approximately 50 to 65 years old. So our goal is to understand the relationship between running time and age. Now, what complete pooling means is simply looking at the data all at once. So we have age on the horizontal, the, the time on the vertical, but otherwise we're going to ignore um, the fact that seven dots came from runner one, seven dots came from runner two, et cetera. So just looking at this information together, these two variables, complete pooling means we're just gathering all the observations into one, one variable, which is age. When we try out linear regression on this situation, we're going to get a slope near that's nearly zero, which might be counterintuitive because especially talking about uh, people in this uh, slightly older age group, wouldn't we get slower as, as we get older? Looking at the data set, we'll focus on three of the runners, just for examples. Runners um, 1, 20, and 22. And if we apply the regression slope that's to the overall picture, but we look at it as far as the individual runners are concerned, this doesn't 
make much sense yet. Okay, so for contrast, uh, let's briefly talk about the concept of no polling. We're going to treat each runner separately and a separate regression model for each one. So there are going to be 36 runners, 36 regression models. For those runners, one, two, and three, at least individually, we get regression slopes and lines that make more sense for them. It sounds good at first. However, um, later on, if we're trying to use this to predict behavior with other runners, this cannot reliably generalize. And assumes one group doesn't contain information about another. So, for example, uh, for the for the runners that were selected here, it appears that the one on the left, runner number one, uh, gets faster with age. But we're kind of asking ourselves, does the evidence really show that? So hierarchical data, you're, we're thinking about these um, levels in how we group things. Uh, we mentioned these examples at the beginning. So as the chapter is implying, we have a compromise, a middle ground between the concepts of complete and no pulling. We're going to proceed uh, through the next few chapters with the concept of partial pulling. And this will provide insight into both within group variability and between group variability. If you've taken a statistics class before, you probably heard these terms within group and between group in analysis of variance and interaction effects. So then what partial polling will do for us This is perhaps a lot of information, so let's um, dissect this a bit. We have the three sample runners, runner one, runner 20, and runner 22. The complete pooling, the complete pooling is the regression line that would have gone through here. And that is in the solid black line. With, without polling, the no polling, for each individual runner, they have their own regression line, and that's in blue. Now, the a hierarchical model will create the third option in the dash line. We're not going to see how to do this yet, but it'll create an, the compromise situation in with the dash line. Now, looking at the dash line there in the top left, it's now lining up with our intuition that as a runner gets older, they will take more time to complete the race, that they will be slower. And that's partially because we're helping bring in information about the other runners as well to help us get a more complete picture. 
part of the reason why the bottom right picture for you is kind of empty is that in the no pool situation in blue, we did not have any data for you, so we could not make you a regression line. However, because we have historical data for other runners, perhaps similar to you, I'm talking to the video audience, perhaps similar to you, we do have the dashed line model for the hierarchical model. And with that, we could perhaps make decent predictions for your running speed. Okay. So hopefully that motivated the need for hierarchical models. And we briefly ex explored complete pooling, no pool pooling, and the partial pooling models. So from here on out, we look forward to seeing these chapters and finishing off this textbook.